we think of St. Patrick, we're thinking of a man with a bishop's hat on, dressed in green, standing on a snake with a shamrock. None of that is true. I think if St. Patrick was here, you would enjoy it. Of course he would. <laughs> be having a wee drink or two, I'm sure. <laughs> Fighting with the fairies. <laughs> We all know about the St. Patrick's Day parades and celebrations on the 17th of March. Very little of that really leads us back to the 5th century Patrick. Do you think there's a serious message behind St. Patrick? Not really, it's just like partying, having fun. Like, yeah. <laughs> He's kind of the embodiment of Ireland and he becomes the essence of, of Irishness. And for you, what's St. Patrick's Day about? The crack and the Guinness. Yes. The day brings everyone together and that's how it should be. Fun day. And two friends, one Protestant, one Catholic getting together <laughs> because it's for everyone. The celebration of St. Patrick's Day becomes a global event that everybody's Irish on, on Paddy's Day. Who St. Patrick was is shrouded in a great deal of historical mystery. Many people are still surprised to learn that Patrick was not Irish. In fact, he was a Roman Briton who had been born and raised in a Roman family. He came from Banovem to Bernii, although nobody really knows where that is. St. Patrick spent the first 16 years of his life as a Roman, living in Roman Britain, his father and grandfather being clerics. He would have had his own slaves, lived in a big house, and life would have been pretty good until he was 16. He would have been given an education, um, and he probably grew up in a Christian household. He was a teenager. If he'd had an iPod, he would have had his headset turned up full. He wasn't interested in religion. In the 4th century, Rome was this huge global empire that stretched from the Irish Sea all the way to Persia. And Rome eventually conquers Roman Britain, but doesn't conquer the lands of the Scoti, which is northern Scotland and Ireland. You cannot look at Ireland in isolation. You have to look in a broader context of what was happening in Europe. Um, the last Roman legions had left Britain around the year 410 or 411. The political authority in Rome, in Britain, had disappeared. Most early descriptions of Ireland are from Roman accounts. They don't like the Irish. They describe the Irish as a gluttonous, incestuous lot, prone to internecine strife and fratricidal wars. The Irish had been making raids on the west coast of Britain and Wales and the west coast from around the, the 350s and 60s onwards. With a weakening Roman authority, they could slip in and out with these raids on a regular basis. So as Western Rome falls, the glory of it as an imperial power is now dissipated. When the Roman legions are called back to Rome to defend it against the barbarians, people like Patrick and his family became vulnerable to Irish raiding parties. The Irish pirates attacked the estate and the castle was burned to the ground and only the youngest son, Patrice, survived from the slaughter. He's lost everything, right? He's lost his home, he's lost his family. Probably he saw his mother and father killed in front of his own eyes. So Patrick is brought as a slave child to Ireland. This is Mount Schlemish, which is traditionally thought to be the place where Patrick was held as a slave in Ireland. We know the story because he tells us about it in his confession. My name is Patrick, a sinner without education, least of all the faithful and greatly despised in the eyes of many. I was about 16 years of age at the time I was taken captive to Ireland with thousands of people. Most of the land all the way around this mountain would have been densely forested. 
in the winter time. This place is ferocious for its wind, for its freezing temperatures, for its ice, for its snow. He would have sheltered under the trees. He may have had little small wooden buildings that he was able to sleep in, made out of wood. It would have been very, very primitive. So Patrick experienced that desert spirituality for himself when he was a slave. Everything had been stripped from him. And it is in that moment when he'd lost everything that he found God. And there the Lord revealed to me the nature of my unbelief so that I should recall my transgressions and turn my whole heart to God. That he used to go out and pray a hundred times a day and in the night, a hundred times a night, when he was alone on the hillside looking after the sheep and the cattle. The love of God surrounded me so much. I used to rise at dawn to say prayers through the snow, the ice and the rain. Because he says the spirit was fervent within me. His faith comes alive in captivity. And I get the impression his faith matters to him more than anything else. He seems to have started to dream dreams. He seems to have started to have visions because he tells us that one night in his dream, he saw this angel figure called Victor who said to him, Patrick, you have done well in your fasting. Soon you will go back to your homeland. And then Patrick tells us that a couple of nights later, he was disturbed by another dream in the night and Victor appeared to him again and said, Patrick, your ship is ready. And as a result of those dreams, Patrick says, the next day he decided that was it. And he ran away. It would have been very dangerous to think of escaping his captors in the early 400s. Ireland was a patchwork quilt of little kingdoms. There were no roads, there were no towns, there was no quick way of escaping. Which was a very dangerous thing for a slave to do, because if you ran away from your slave master, it was at pain of death. He was travelling uh, over bogs and meadows and trying to avoid people, probably following the coastline, until he comes to the southeastern part of Ireland. He walked for 200 miles before he found a ship that was waiting for him. And that ship could easily have been here uh, in the port of Wicklow. And he meets some sailors and he prays and he believes that God tells him that he will be accepted and he will escape. And, and true to the word, they do get onto the boat and he's allowed to escape from Ireland. But unfortunately, they become shipwrecked. We think on the northern coast of France, and they start to starve, they pray to their pagan gods, nothing happens. So they say, Patrick, you get this strange Christian God, why don't you pray to him? Patrick prays, herd of pigs appear, sailors much impressed. And to this day, St. Patrick is the patron saint of French fishermen because he saved the sailors. Eventually made his way back to Britain where he was reunited with his family. I believe I had been helped by Christ my Lord and that his spirit already then called out for me, as I hope it will on the day of my deliverance. He's 23 now. He'd been away for what, seven years? He finds his way home and they beg him and they say, Patrick, after everything that you've suffered and we've suffered, please don't leave us to go anywhere else. In his dreams one night, he believes that God tells him he should return to Ireland, the place of his childhood nightmares. And that's a huge move for someone who has been trafficked to these people. He has this vision of a man called Victorinus coming from Ireland with an innumerable number of letters and then hears the voice of the Irish by the wood of Vauclut. We beg you, all of you, to come and walk, and walk once more among us. Walk once more among us. It was a nightmare. He said he woke up feeling heartbroken. But he says, thanks be to God, after many years now, their cries have been heard by the Lord. There is a lot of speculation among scholars as to how long the period was between his return 
uh, after slavery and his ordination as a priest and his eventual ordination or consecration as a bishop. And it's hard to imagine it would have been less than two decades. It could have been as much as three decades. The imperial world is gone. But nonetheless, there's somebody here in, in Gaul saying, Patrick, there's a big island out there. It's full of pagans. It needs to be Christianized. That's your life's mission. I think Patrick's years of enslavement prepared him spiritually, but also helped him to understand the culture he was going back to. He was well prepared. Those years were God's pedagogy, God's preparing him to give them the good news. So Patrick had this strong sense of divine call, and, and therefore he really didn't have a lot to lose. I'm Tori Bauckham. I'm the rector at Truro Church in Fairfax, Virginia. And I have a group of 30 friends and congregants with me for 10 days studying the life of St. Patrick, the peacemaker. A professor who is very beloved to me is my church history professor, Les Fairfield, from Trinity Seminary in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. So I recruited him to come and be our resident expert on this trip and to teach us about the life of St. Patrick. In my view, Patrick, when he escaped from slavery and made his way home to Britain, was sponsored for ordination by his family and people who knew him, was ordained by British bishops. Ireland was outside their territory. And so insofar as they were concerned, it was all right for Patrick to go to Ireland as long as he didn't make any trouble for them back home. Christianity in the Roman Empire had become imperial religion. In other words, it was in bed with empire and all of the complications that come with being embedded with power. So it seems that P Patrick was at least trained theologically within the imperial mission rather than within the Celtic mission. So now he's probably closer to 40 years of age. This time he returns not as a slave to the Druids or a slave to the Irish, but he returns as a slave of Christ, freely, as a servant of God. I had come to the people of Ireland to preach the gospel and to suffer great insults from non-believers as well as many persecutions and imprisonment because I decided to give up my privileged life for the benefit of others. He came to this valley, came up the River Slaney at the bottom of the hill here. Probably come from the continent, from Gaul, because that's where his monastic training took place. He would have sailed over with probably 12 companions. We have to assume that he would have arrived here in the northern part of Ireland. He seems to come to Dunham, or, or the Great Dun. Dun in Irish means fort, and County Down, one of 32 counties in Ireland. This is all named after the fort, which was later itself named after Patrick Down Patrick. And he comes here because he had an experience of coming to the northernmost part of Ireland. He knew the people. And the High King of the northern part of Ireland lived here in the Great Dun, where Down Patrick is now. This is the ancient site. The tradition is very strong that this is the first place in Ireland where St. Patrick built a small church. But it's a very, very interesting story about new beginnings because it was a new beginning for him. And he came up to this area and he encountered a local chieftain who was called Dikku. And they talked and eventually Dikku gave Patrick his barn as his first church. I rise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the splendor of fire, speed of lightning. We kind of go through a doorway in time uh, with the language itself, with the Gaelic language itself, because in Irish, the Gaelic Irish word for barn is sabal. God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me. He builds the first church in Ireland in a barn or a sabal, which is anglicized to Saul, which is still there today, almost 1600 years later. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the His heart first church is small, it's made of wood. 
and that's where he developed his ministry uh, in Ireland from this place. I rise today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. This new church, which was built in 1933, it's a Church of Ireland community. It is a living parish church. Reverend Henry Hull, who's the Dean of Dan Patrick Cathedral, is the rector here. On St. Patrick's Day, or the day that we have the festival, we begin our day at the church at Saul. We begin with a service. After that service, a group of pilgrims walk from Saul into Dine Patrick to the cathedral. When Patrick arrived in Ireland in 432, Ireland was an entirely agricultural society without towns or cities. There were trading posts on the coasts of the Irish Sea especially, but inland Ireland was completely agricultural. Divided into perhaps 150 tribes or tuaha as they were called, which might range in number from a small tribe of 10,000 up to a much larger tribe of 50,000, let's say. Each of these tribes was governed by a king whose chief job it was to defend the territory of the tribe. Cattle was the currency and, and farming was the culture. The herds were the most important thing, so you spent your time guarding and protecting the herds and increasing the herd sizes. It was like landing on the moon for somebody like Patrick. And the idea that um, he would have been welcomed with open arms is quite naive. Patrick relied upon his personality, his diplomatic skills, uh, his ability to uh, work with other people and sense what they needed to continue to carry the gospel message in these very tense and difficult areas. You're not going to win them over with propositional truth. You're not actually going to go over and have theological debates with the chieftains and with the juridic leaders. The, the Druids were the spiritual leaders of the Celtic people. These were people who came into Ireland about 500 years before Christ. Their tribe was divided really into two halves. One half were the spiritual people, who were organized all the rituals, all the sacrifices. They included actually the poets, the musicians. Now, all the artistic side were expressed by the Druids, whereas the other half of the population were training for battle and war. They were soldiers, men and women. If the High King was having a big pageant or a meal, people would be seated at big tables, but he'd be at the top table with his wife and next to him would be the chief druid. The druids were the religious experts of the Irish people in the early 400s before Patrick arrived. They were the intermediaries between human beings and the gods, the gods who were seen as powerful but capricious in their attitude toward humans, just as nature could put on a smiling face and the sun could bless rich crops, but also nature could put on a frowning face and send hail and wind and destroy the crop while it was in the fields. So it was the Druids' business to figure out what the gods wanted and help the tribe give it to them. We have very little written records of the Druids, but we know from contemporary culture, and even in Ireland, stories passed down through the generations, that there would have been a far more sympathetic figures than to the bloodthirsty, devil-worshipping uh, child killers that Christianity or Western Europe actually portrayed them as. The Druidic communities were often situated in great oak groves and very typically of the Celts, they worshipped and they prayed outside uh, rather than in confined places. And this carries over into the Celtic Christian tradition, which often refers to the cathedral of earth, sea and sky. Patrick had to go in with something other than argument and debate. And 
the only thing he could take that would impress them would be the sacraments. That the sacraments of baptism, of the Eucharist, that the mentality of the Irish would grasp that faster and get water as something cleansing, even as complex as, as the understanding of the real presence is in the Eucharist, that they would get that because of their pagan beliefs. For this reason, therefore, we ought to fish well and conscientiously, stretch out our nets far enough for a huge multitude and gathering to be captured for God. Patrick presented to the Irish people the one high God who stood behind and above all powers of nature and fertility and death and new life. His ministry was really, we think, a lot directed towards the slaves. You know, Irish slaves, British slaves. He had escaped from that slavery, but many of his friends had been captured as slaves, and he came back to Ireland to, to try and minister to them and to, to help them to find their freedom. And having learn to know these slaves to whom he could relate because of his own experience. He learned to know the first tribe and at some point he must have gained access to the king and preached the gospel to the king. So he got the first king to back him, to give him gold so that he could go with the king's sons to the next tribe, the neighboring tribe, and give gold as an offering. Since Ireland is a gift exchange society, he had to have something to present to the king, otherwise he would be a bad guest and in danger of having his head cut off. I actually would err on the side that he was so well prepared that he took cattle with him because it wasn't just a matter of having gifts to give to the chieftains, which you would need to do all over the country because you were dealing with different tribes. But I think it was his intention to do settlements, that once he went into certain areas, that he was going to teach the Christians, those who would become Christians, how to live. Remember that Patrick was in danger of his life every minute he was in Ireland as a missionary bishop. So when he went from place to place, from kingdom to kingdom, there were always threats or the potential for threats against him and his followers. Patrick had to begin the process of peacemaking vulnerably. That is to start with the hearts of individuals and create communities of peaceful people in the hopes that that seed would grow and in due time influence the whole nation. Patrick introduced Jesus and the way of peace, that the way through the suffering of the world is not through more suffering and not backed by the sword of the conqueror, whoever that conqueror might be. If you go anywhere with an inspiring story, which the story of Jesus is, and you, you show how taking on that story into your society would help to inspire some changes in your society for the better, like loving one another, like forgiving your enemy, like being generous and being kind, all of which Jesus was teaching. It would seem to me maybe of benefit to these kings and queens to take on this story without dismissing all the previous ones. That's what's been happening these days in Ireland, as those without knowledge of God until now, except through idols, have now become the Lord's people and are called sons of God and the sons and daughters of Irish chieftains are seen to be monks and virgins of Christ. The kings here were extremely powerful and they were so powerful that one of them, his name was Congolok, he became High King of Ireland. 
Hi Kings are seated at the hill of Tara. Tara is off in this direction about 20 miles away. You can see Tara from the top of the mound. So we are even within visual distance of one of the most important and sacred sites in Ireland. The centre of Pagan Island was the High King's Palace at Tara and the Druids were in attendance there. The King of Tara is told by his chief Druid, the Christians have arrived in the Bion Valley, let's move now, let's squash them. One of Patrick's early biographers tells a story about the conflict between the Hill of Slain, where we are, and the Hill of Tara behind us. Tara was the seat of the High Kings of Ireland and King Leary at the time, this would have been about 450 AD, King Leary at the time claimed the right to light the fire at the Feast of Baaltana, which was the spring feast, roughly like May Day. But fortunately that year, Baaltana coincided with Easter. And uh, although Patrick knew that the consequences of his lighting an unauthorized fire could be severe, before King Leary had a chance to light the fire on the hill of Tara, Patrick lit the Paschal fire here on top of the hill of Slain. The Druids saw it from the hill of Tara. They warned the High King in the story. They said to the High King, look, Leary, if you do not extinguish this fire, if you do not put this fire out, we have seen in our visions that it will spread through the whole of your kingdom and the old religion will be destroyed. When Patrick sees them coming and knows that his life is in danger, he shapeshifts. He turns from being a human being into being a deer and his followers do too and they disappear into the forest so that they can't be caught. And that's a very Irish form of storytelling because uh, shape-shifting in ancient Ireland was very common. The Lord has shown mercy to me on thousands and thousands of occasions because he saw that I was ready. But I did not always know what to do in the circumstances. I think probably most of his ministry would have been in the northeastern part of Ireland. The crux of it is that he founded Armagh, and Armagh became the ecclesiastical capital of Ireland, the power base of Christianity. Armagh is different. It is this ancient, ancient city whose streets wound around this hill because this was where the monastery was. This was the centre. It's been here basically for 1,500 years. wonderful story of how Patrick got to, to meet the chieftain here. The local chieftain was called Dara. Dara asked Patrick, you know, where would you like to build your church? And Patrick told him, well, I'd, I'd like that hill up there, which is where we're standing right now, the, the highest point in the town. And as he got to know the king, and as the king got to know him better, so that they were not strangers to each other, any longer, but they had built up a relationship of trust and confidence. Then the chieftain came to Patrick one day and he said, Patrick, I am now ready. The land is now yours. Inside the church, we've seen stained glass windows, which are, represent the laying of the foundation stone with the chieftain Dara present when Patrick lays the foundation stone for this small stone church. There's even a picture in the east window of Patrick on a throne holding a book in his left hand and on top of the book is a little stone church. 
And then just across the way on the adjacent hill is the beautiful Roman Catholic Cathedral, a much more modern building, but very magnificent in its, its architecture and its style. Both of them are dedicated to St. Patrick and both of them are the metropolitan capitals for the respective churches. And on the top of this hill of Armagh, where Patrick had his first church and where the great monastery of Armagh was founded, that monastery developed one of the most famous monastic schools in Ireland. In around 675, one of the scribes at the monastery, Murku, he was commissioned by a bishop here to write the first life of St. Patrick that we know of. And we have that, it's survived in the Book of Armagh. The original is preserved in Trinity College Dublin from the 9th century, but there are facsimile editions, two of which are preserved here in Armagh in the Robinson Library. It's a manuscript that contains many different texts. It contains the earliest full version of the Gospels in Ireland. It's probably one of the most important Irish manuscripts that we have. And the reason for that is that it preserves some of the earliest Irish writings that survive. So those include the lives of St. Patrick by Muraku and Tira Khan, and then some other fragmentary notes about Patrick as well. In the Book of Armagh, there is this writing by a man called Tirakon um, of St. Patrick's travels in the west of Ireland. How much of it is legendary? What is the core of fact at the heart of it? Heaven only knows. The idea about writing about the lives of saints is a process called hagiography. It's kind of like an early Christian spin doctor idea where you're spinning the story to suit yourself. The hagiographies often are described as mythic histories, but usually the hagiography contains some legends as well, and they're, they're intertwined in such a way that it's, it's quite hard to undo those strands and find what's historically true in terms of the, the flesh and blood person, if you like. Chira Khan and Murakul, their biographies of Patrick written to enhance the power of the saint, enhance the power of the monastery of our man. It's not that Muraku was trying to come up with a completely different story. Rather, what Muraku is doing is he's very much following in the footsteps of other biographers of saints, where the life of the saint was written not just to write the history of the saint, but rather to write a venerative history of the saint. In Tirukhan's writing, we get lots of detail of Patrick traveling from community to community, setting up churches, consecrating bishops and essentially setting up the ecclesiastical Christian framework of the island. Now this developed over the centuries and we have several broader interpretations of Patrick. With each new interpretation, God loved them trying to sell Patrick better. The stories got more expansive. St. Patrick, he hit the ground of Ireland with his bishop's staff. So when he hit the ground of Ireland, the soil transformed and it became a soil that no reptile or snake could tolerate. So they all began to make their way out of Ireland, struggling and writhing and so on, to make their way out of the country. The biggest of them, in Gaelic called the Olafeist, the Great Beast, as it struggled and writhed, its movements uh, created the channel of, for our biggest river, our longest river, the River Shannon. This tradition has come down through all these centuries that he showed them a shamrock and the shamrock was supposed to embody the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in three because he knew three was an important number to them and they worshipped vegetation. So he worked in ways like that. He wasn't trying to be a Greek theologian. He was just trying to give the Irish some visual representation that they could take home with them if the story is as legends have it. So 
So there is a story about the King of Cashel and that he came to Patrick, welcomed Patrick to the area and that um, as Patrick was blessing him that his crozier pierced through the foot of the king um, and Patrick never noticed that he was doing this. However, miraculously, of course, Patrick, through his saintly powers, is able to cure the king and the king converts to Christianity. A tradition developed that on Station Island that God pointed St. Patrick to a, a particular place, a cave, and that in that cave there was something that would show that the Christian thing was a real message, a powerful message. So what it was, was the entrance to purgatory. So Patrick apparently went there, saw this, and was able to convince local people of the truth of Christian doctrine. He sees heaven and he sees hell. And there are many different versions of this legend. For a long time, pilgrims would go into the cave um, in imitation of Patrick's experience and try to have a vision themselves. Uh, but at some point, access to the cave was blocked off and you had the, the church built um, on, on the island. It's a basilica and dormitories for the pilgrims. And you can see now some pilgrims barefoot walking around the basilica doing their station prayer. You get a constant flow of people coming to experience this thing of being in a cave, of being enclosed, um, of coming into contact with the the redemptive power of Christianity. You get people coming here from a desire to return to the church, a sense of penitence. So at the end of that, they feel renewed and they want to come back into contact then with their Christianity and their roots. It's kind of like a personal revival here at Loch Derg and its lake. Everybody who was starting a monastery around Ireland wanted to be linked in to Patrick. They wrote him into their legends. My monastery is more important than your monastery if Patrick came to my monastery. So then you've got to think about it and say, well, you know, maybe Patrick did come to our monastery. He met our founder. He has become someone who's almost in every field and ditch in Ireland. There is a St. Patrick something or other. So by the 8th and 9th century, Patrick is all over Ireland. He's in Munster, he's in Limerick, he's here, there and everywhere. They create a national saint out of Patrick. He may never have left East Ulster in reality. Like Muraku's life of St. Patrick, um, there's a lot of legendary material in it, but there's surely a core of truth somewhere, but it's unrecoverable. I prefer to work from Patrick's own documents and through the window that they give us into his life and his personality and his faith. I cannot keep silent about the grace which the Lord considered appropriate to bestow upon me. All that we actually have of him is his confession and his letter to the soldiers of Caroticus, which are remarkable in that they are undoubtedly his own writing from the fifth century. They're Christian documents from the fifth century remarkable testimonies to the man, to his faith, to his courage, to his life. There is a lot of humanity in them. You get a sense of his character, much as you get a sense of the Apostle Paul through his writings. There's something that comes through that for me as a dramatist doesn't feel fictional, doesn't feel like it's made up or that somebody attached it later to a mythical figure of Patrick that didn't really exist. For me, when I'm reading the letters of St. Patrick, he speaks in the first person singular, so you really feel he's speaking personally to you. He has shown me that I can put my faith in him without wavering and without end. He was the last of the Romans to write his message down. So the reason he's writing this is because he is a Roman, a, a cleric, well beyond the frontier of Roman territory. He's someone who's in trouble. And he's trying to justify his mission because the people who had sent him no longer believe in him or his mission. How could he then afterwards 
come to disgrace me in public before all. Patrick writes um, his epistola, his epistola to the soldiers of Caroticus. And in this piece, what Patrick actually says is that some of his converts, his Irish converts, have been taken as slaves by a warlord called Caroticus. They are bloodstained, bloodstained with the blood of innocent Christians, whose numbers I have given birth to in God and confirmed in Christ. He was a British pirate. He wasn't an Irish pirate. And hence, he was superficially a Christian. Caroticus had sent soldiers over to Ireland and it had attacked Patrick's church in Saul. Several people had been killed and then the soldiers of Caroticus had carried away some of the, the newly baptized converts. And they, Patrick says they still had the oil of baptism, the oil of chrism on their foreheads, and they were still wearing their white garments when the church was attacked. They were carried off, the girls and some boys, back to Scotland with the soldiers, and Patrick's church was, was ransacked. I'm compelled by the zeal of God in support of my loved ones. He's full of grief, and he, it's, it's like his heart is broken. He tries to convince Caroticus to let his converts go. I implore you, make amends to God and set free the servants of God and women baptised in Christ. When he refuses to do so, Patrick then uses his powers as a bishop to assert his authority. He dared to write home to the bishops in Britain demanding that they excommunicate Caroticus. If God inspires them, there is still a chance they may live for God and be made whole both here and for eternity. Of course, we cannot know for certain. There isn't any uh, factual evidence what happened to the men and women after Patrick wrote to Caroticus, but I choose to believe Caroticus did respond, was ashamed, and did send back the survivors. The Celtic Cross in Ireland, that you see everywhere, it's a very, very common symbol. It originated among the Druids. They had invented this sign long before it became a Christian sign. And then these increasingly grow and become much more ornate and intricately beautiful, usually on one side of a highly ornate carved high cross. There will be nature imagery and then on the other side, there will be scenes from the Bible carved into the cross. And that's a very beautiful expression of how the Celtic tradition honored both what was called the little book, book of scripture, and what was called the big book, the book of the universe. It was the cathedral of earth, sea, and sky that Celts wanted to pray in the midst of and they would do so in gathering around the high standing crosses. The Christianity that was in Ireland was monastic in the southern part where monasticism had developed, but it hadn't developed in the northern half. So his job was to work and promote that in the north. If you read his writings, what he talks about is all of these people, especially women, wanting to become nuns in monasteries and founding monasteries, to his surprise. People from the tribes would join the monasteries, married monks would live in the second circle, outside the circle of the church and the cemetery. Married monks from the community would keep the community going in terms of food which was crucial. These monasteries, these communities, were basically large subsistence farms. And so these are the people, these are the Christians that took off in Ireland. It's a booming population. We estimate now in Ireland, in early Christian times, there could have been three million people here. 3,000 monasteries. 
So it was, you know, it was a golden age of Christianity globally. Ireland was one of the throbbing hearts of it. It was this network of Christian communities that gradually, painfully, from the 500s onwards, supplied models of peaceful living where people could reprogram their impulses to humility and friendship and mutual care. So the long-lasting legacy of Patrick was not merely bringing the gospel, which was crucial, but it was blessing the early communities of sisters and brothers who founded colonies of heaven where people could learn to live the life that our Lord taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when we think of monasteries, we think of men living alone or women living alone. But in those days, many of the early Irish monasteries, you had men and women living together. The abbot was the one who held the power, or the abbess, if it was a woman. I mean, St. Bridget, for example, in the generation after St. Patrick, St. Bridget was an abbess in Kildare. She was in charge of a monastery of men and women. past of St. Patrick and we'll pick up the ancient past again in, in a couple of more days. We're now moving into looking at the current troubles of Ireland. Uh, Les is going to give a talk later this morning to get us some The very thick stone structures that are here on this side put in to prevent car bombs. Put in to prevent car bombs. Thirty six hundred people were murdered over thirty years in a very small population. Um, Eighty thousand people were directly injured, and um, up to five hundred thousand people were injured or bereaved in a population of about one point five million during that period of time. It's very hard to explain the two outsiders to Northern Ireland the story of what we've been going through. And if I say to you it's even harder for us to understand what it's all about. Part of Ireland, called Northern Ireland, has remained part of the United Kingdom of England, Scotland and Wales. The rest of Ireland has been a republic on its own, a nation, for many, many years. And the tension between the two on that front was, until fairly recently, a very severe tension. We were outnumbered, so they were on the streets. The police were on top of these buildings here, shooting at the young people in the streets. So we set these ones here at the front on, on, on fire to try and get the soldiers or the policemen off the buildings. This there were those in Northern Ireland who wanted to see that border go and Ireland reunited and Northern Ireland part of a whole island republic. There were those who were equally determined that would never happen. Uh, I got involved in this conflict at the age of 16. Uh, I ended up at the age of 20, serving three life sentences in over 200 years in the eight blocks here. So again, our time in Belfast was to give a taste of what it was like during the Troubles. Hearing the testimonies of those who fought, who were wounded and prisoners of war, helped us to realize how deep those wounds still are, how much healing yet needs to be done. 20,000 of us, there was no kids on the street, we were all in jail. It, it was questions to do with, are we Irish or British here? What are we? Who should be in charge here? If I'm Irish here and this has been called British, am I a foreigner? I never made a choice in my life to be British. That was never a choice. I was born British. Predominantly in history, British identity was Protestant, well, Irish identity was Catholic. And so it's within that context that religion comes into it. So with the hours of darkness, there's no movement between these communities. Protestant, Catholic, Loyalist, Nationalist, Unionist... Patrick considered himself the victim of injustice. He would have been appalled and so deeply saddened by what he saw if he were there. 
I would imagine he'd be in the front line of marching and speaking out very powerfully and being involved in negotiations and mediations between the parties. Well, most of the young people were shot in the hips, in the bum, the thighs and the ankles, but they killed too. There's a, Throughout there's the a, struggle there's a, there's of the Troubles, church life was really like an ambulance service. But listen, for every innocent Protestant died, an innocent Catholic lost their life too. So for me... Picking up the injured, picking up the grieving, picking up the people who would never get over the hurt, and ministering to them, talking about peace and stability as a far-off dream, but finding it so hard to actually make it work. Since the troubles ended, the custom has grown up in certain areas, flashpoint areas, of constructing walls so that people didn't have to communicate, didn't have to look at each other, didn't have to cohabit together. They became known as peace walls and they are grotesque, they're horrible but they've become a tourist attraction. People want to come and see a peace wall. One of the great aims for those that follow me should be to see those walls coming down because they're not needed anymore. There are Christian priests and Christian pastors that are learning to work together across these divides and see their common faith, their common core faith, as a resource for healing. We saw this at the New Life Center in Belfast with Pastor Jack McKee. The building itself is unique because the building literally straddles the dividing line in Belfast. Half of the building is on the Protestant side of the divide and half the building is on the Catholic side of the divide. And so that enables us to reach out to both communities. This becomes a place of reconciliation because people come here, they meet with each other, they have coffee, and they come from both sides of the divide. We're reaching out to the community at very practical levels every single day of the week. If there's one thing that encourages the terrorist organizations to continue to exist, is their sense of purpose when they see the dividing wall and they see the gates that are closing every day. It continues to give them their raison d'etre. It continues to give them their reason to exist. You take away the division, then their reason to exist is removed. One of the great challenges for the next generation is to tell people you'll never get on until you take a wall down and understand there's more that unites you than divides you. The one who hates another person counts as a murderer. The one who lacks love towards others lives in death. You would have had generations of tribes in Patrick's time that hated each other just because they'd been doing it for generations. And then he comes in with this message saying, you have to let go of your history of violence and of hatred and embrace this new kind of forgiveness in order to find true peace. The way forward for the Irish people was to know that Jesus was alive and active and wanted people to learn the way of peace, the way of thinking twice before retaliating. And in particular, I have an interest in pilgrimage landscapes and sacred landscapes, which we have many in Ireland, of course, and the interface between the pre-Christian world and the Christian world. I've been working on pilgrimage sites, including Crow Patrick, this magnificent, beautiful mountain. So Crow Patrick Mountain in County Mayo uh, is named for the saint. So a uh, Crook. Patrick or Patrick's Cone uh, is locally called the Reek because of the, the mountain's conical shape. Overlooking the Atlantic, bounded by mountains, with a summit monastery on top, where Patrick is said to have spent 40 days and nights 
top of the mountain, very much in, in acknowledgement or copying or mimicking the old biblical story. The excitement to build through the summer. When, when is Cropatrix? When is Law Fail Aparic? When are we going? When you see the mountain, it's just one of these spectacularly beautiful places. High cones, steep sided, visible from miles around. Onto the mountainside, up the scree slope, into the church, celebrating the Mass, confessions, and then coming down that incredible steep slope. The islands in Clue Bay come out of the fog and you can see there's thousands of people just winding up and down. People crying, people praying, people saying they're never going to come up here again. People just gobsmacked at the sheer beauty, the nature of the world all laid out like this huge, vast canvas underneath you as you descend the mountain. nice thing about pilgrimage is you don't have to be a scholar to appreciate it, you don't have to be a clergyman. The spiritual fruits from pilgrimage flow to you from doing the pilgrimage. I call it working in the spirit of St. Patrick. The spirit of St. Patrick here is reconciliation in this part of Ireland. Beyond the island of Ireland, everybody can do their little bit personally or perhaps as a group to be able to help other people. We need to find a way beyond marching and parading to represent St. Patrick. So the long lasting legacy of Patrick was blessing the early communities of sisters and brothers who founded colonies of heaven where people could learn to live the life that our Lord taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. Every type of, of Christian church or individual can connect with Patrick as an early Christian missionary, as the Apostle of Ireland. I think Patrick's forgiveness of the Irish and his return to them comes out of his faith and out of a vision of Jesus Christ. He is today for me something in whose inheritance all Christians in Ireland can share. He comes from an age before Christian divisions. And when you read his statement of faith early on in the confession, it's something to which we could all subscribe. Though there is a lot that divides us culturally and historically, there's one name that still continues to unite us, and that's St. Patrick. What makes Patrick such a great saint is that if we enter into his heart, and into his mind, and into his spirit, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits will be totally transformed. He packed a lot in to that last decade or maybe two of his life. I would say we know precious little about when, where, how his life ended. Patrick was willing to cross boundaries to bring good news to poor and suffering people. He was the first evangelist in Western Europe to bring the story beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire, reminding us if we have to go outside our comfort zone, cross borders of class or culture or ethnicity, that there's precedent for that in the great proto-evangelist of Ireland, St. Patrick. 
I pray, therefore, to those who believe and fear God, whoever may happen to read or come upon this letter which Patrick has written in Ireland. I have tried to show forth these small things according to God's will and pleasure. It would be much better to understand and believe the truth that it was all a gift from God. And this is my confession before I die. He was taken captive to Ireland and sold as a slave in the country for which he later became the Oracle.